Aggressive Roman engineers and legionnaires paved roads through impassable mountains, erected amphitheaters for tens of thousands of spectators in a matter of years, and built entire military fortresses in a few hours. Their methods were so effective that many of their creations, from roads to aqueducts, are still in use today, two millennia later. It was not magic or divine intervention, but cold calculation, impeccable organization, and a few engineering secrets that were lost for a long time. Watch the video to the end and you will learn how the Romans managed to stay ahead of their time, what secret material allowed them to build underwater, and why a disciplined legionnaire with a shovel was more formidable than a legionnaire with a sword. I will reveal the most closely guarded secret of Roman engineers, and it is not about any invention. While the Greeks sought to create a unique one-of-a-kind masterpiece in every temple, the Romans professed a different philosophy, the philosophy of absolute standardization. It was this approach that allowed them to copy and paste cities, bridges, and roads throughout the empire at an incredible speed. Their main goal was not uniqueness, but functionality, speed, and durability multiplied by scale. For the Roman state, engineering was as much an instrument of power as legions or laws. A road built in a wild province immediately turned it into part of Rome. An aqueduct supplying water made life in a new city as comfortable as in the capital. 100 different bridges was elevated to an absolute where every engineer and every architect was first and foremost a civil servant. Instead of inventing something new for each project, the Romans refined and replicated the best solutions. They took the arch from the Etruscans and turned it into a universal building block from which anything could be assembled from a bridge to the Colosseum. They did not build 100 different bridges, they built the same type of bridge 100 times, bringing the process to the point of automatism. This unification saved time on design and training. Every Roman engineer or architectus underwent rigorous training based on proven manuals and principles. They used a single set of tools and a single system of weights and measures. Thanks to this, an engineer from Syria could easily lead construction in Britain. All drawings and plans were understandable, and construction methods were identical throughout the empire. This standardization applied not only to large projects, but also to the smallest details. The size of bricks, the composition of mortar, the width of the roaded, all of this was regulated. This approach made it possible to calculate the required amount of materials and labor in advance. Logistics, not just construction, was Rome's strong point, and it was based precisely on these standards. Practicality was their highest virtue, and this is evident in everything they did. If, for example, to achieve the goal of laying a straight road, it was necessary to demolish a hill or dig a tunnel, they did so, they did not look for detours, but subjugated the landscape to their will in their designs. This straightforwardness was not only engineering, but also political. That is why we see so many Roman colonial cities that are similar to each other, built according to a single model. A rectangular grid of streets, a forum in the center, a standard set of public buildings, baths, a theater, a temple. When a legion arrived at a new location, it did not have to think about how to plan the city. It already had a ready-made template that only needed to be implemented. The Romans were the first in history to create a system in which engineering knowledge was separated from specific craftsmen and turned into a replicable state resource. They created an engineering conveyor belt. 1,500 years before Henry Ford, this system was capable of reproducing complex objects with predictable quality and within specified time frames. Ultimately, the speed of Roman construction was not the result of the genius of individuals, but of the flawless work of the system, organization, logistics, standardization, and an almost endless supply of disciplined labor. The Romans built quickly. 
not because they were geniuses, but because they turned construction into a science as precise as warfare. Is this obsession with standardization a sign of genius or a lack of creativity? The Romans did not simply build for themselves, they built for eternity. Their methods ensured that their creations would endure for centuries, far beyond their time. Roman concrete used in their massive ports, bridges, and aqueducts continues to outlast modern cement. The key to their success was their revolutionary use of concrete made from volcanic ash, lime, and seawater. The Romans were not just builders, they were innovators in material science, creating a concrete that could set underwater. Roman roads were more than just paths, they were symbols of Roman power, connecting vast territories of the empire. They used their roadways not only for movement, but as a means of establishing control and unity within their vast empire. Roads were paved with meticulous layers, stones, mortar, and gravel, designed for maximum durability and longevity. Every road was built to last centuries, ensuring the Roman Empire's reach would endure far beyond their era. Roman roads didn't just connect cities, they connected an empire, serving as vital arteries for military and commerce. The Roman legion on the march never stopped for the night in an open field. Every evening, regardless of fatigue, weather, or the proximity of the enemy, the legion built a fully fortified camp or castrum. This process was so automated that it took only a few hours. As soon as the legion arrived at the place of overnight stay, which was chosen in advance by scouts and surveyors, coordinated work began. First, the Gromatici marked out a standard rectangular grid for the camp on the ground. They stuck colored flags into the ground to mark the main streets, the Cardo and Decumanus, the location of the commander's tent, the Praetorium, and the altar, while one part of the legion, usually several cohorts, lined up in battle formation for guard duty. The rest of the soldiers immediately set to work with their delabras. Each legionnaire was not only a warrior, but also a digger. Each detachment had its own clearly marked section of the perimeter for which it was responsible. The work began with digging a trench or fossa. This was not just a ditch, but a serious V-shaped barrier up to one and one two meters deep and up to three meters wide. All the earth extracted from the ditch was immediately passed along the chain and laid on the inner edge, forming a rampart or agar. This rampart of compacted earth and turf was in itself a serious obstacle several meters high. But that was not enough. A palisade or vallum was erected on top of the rampart, simultaneously with the construction of the perimeter. Other teams pitched tents inside the camp. Here too, standardization reigned supreme. Each tent designed for eight people, Cubernium, was placed in a strictly designated spot. As a result, an hour after work began, a city with straight streets, neighborhoods, and defensive walls sprang up on the empty field. In the morning, the camp was dismantled just as quickly. The palisade was taken down, the stakes were returned to the baggage train, and the tents were packed away. The mode and rampart were often left behind, and many of these temporary camps can still be seen on satellite images throughout Europe. This skill gave Rome an incredible tactical advantage. This ability to create instant fortresses discouraged opponents. They could not catch the legion off guard at night or force it to fight on their terms. The Romans always fought with their rear and flanks covered by their own fortress, which they carried with them. The speed and efficiency of this process were a direct result of the standardization, discipline, and versatility of the Roman soldier. Everyone knew their maneuver, and everyone had their tool. They did not need blueprints or lengthy meetings. This remarkable engineering routine was as much a part of their combat power as their sword skills. This speed was remarkable. But how did they supply these new cities with water, especially when building permanent fortresses and cities? Roman cities were synonymous with comfort, 
and the basis of that comfort was water. Huge public baths, thermi fountains, private villas, and the general population consumed enormous amounts of water that could not be supplied by wells alone. The solution was the aqueduct, grand structures that carried clean spring water to cities, sometimes tens of kilometers away. The popular image of an aqueduct is a majestic series of stone arches crossing a valley such as the Pont du Gard in France. However, these bridges were only the most spectacular but small part of the system. In fact, more than 90% of the length of any aqueduct ran underground or at ground level. Roman engineers preferred to run the canal in trenches or tunnels dug into the rocks. It was cheaper, faster, and safer. An underground canal was protected from contamination, evaporation in hot weather, and sabotage. Aqueduct bridges were built only as a last resort when it was necessary to cross a river or a deep valley. The secret of the aqueduct was not in the arches, but in gravity. The entire system worked exclusively by gravity. This required incredible precision and calculations from the engineers. The canal had to have a constant, very slight slope along its entire length. Sometimes, to avoid building a giant bridge, they used an inverted siphon system. Water was fed through lead or stone pipes down the slope of the valley and lifted to the other side under pressure. This method required very strong pipes, capable of withstanding the enormous pressure of the water at the lowest point. This proves that the Romans had a perfect understanding of the laws of hydraulics. The aqueduct itself, through which the water flowed, was a concrete trough. Its walls and bottom were covered with a waterproof mortar called opus signinum. This composition prevented water from seeping through and becoming contaminated. The quality of the water at the source was carefully checked. The Romans valued clean, cold spring water in the city, the water flowed into a distribution reservoir, the Castellum, from where it was distributed through a system of lead pipes to public fountains, baths, and the homes of wealthy citizens. The construction of an aqueduct was one of the most expensive and complex projects a city could undertake. It required huge investments and the involvement of the best engineers. However, the result was worth it. The aqueduct instantly transformed a provincial settlement into a full-fledged Roman city, a center of civilization. Nothing demonstrates the engineering power and speed of the Romans, like the construction of amphitheaters. The most famous of these, the Colosseum in Rome, was built in less than 10 years, a time frame that is impressive even today. By comparison, many medieval cathedrals took centuries to build, this speed was achieved through a combination of three factors, ingenious materials, modular construction, and flawless logistics. Unlike the Greeks who carved their theaters into hillsides, the Romans learned to build them on flat ground. This was made possible by two major inventions, Roman concrete and the widespread use of arches. The Colosseum is essentially a skeleton of stone arches filled with concrete vaults and floors. The structure was modular, and the entire amphitheater consisted of repeating sections or cells. This allowed construction to proceed simultaneously on multiple sections. While some workers erected stone arch supports, others poured concrete vaults on the lower tiers. The speed of the Colosseums. Construction was also a political statement. The new Flavian dynasty, which had come to power, wanted to give the people the largest entertainment venue in the world as quickly as possible. It was a project to which all the resources of the empire were devoted. In the provinces, amphitheaters were built just as quickly, often by local legions. The standardized design, an elliptical arena surrounded by tiers of arches and concrete vaults, made it possible to replicate the project throughout the empire. The very fact that the Colosseum has stood for 2,000 years, surviving earthquakes and being dismantled for building materials, testifies to the quality of its design. It is a monument not to architectural sophistication, but to an engineering system, a system of logistics, standardization, 
and ingenious use of materials. Roman engineers did not have laser levels or excavators, but their set of tools was surprisingly effective and accurate. It was these tools, from simple hand tools to complex machines, that allowed them to carry out their grandiose projects at such speed. 2,000 years is a period of time that reduces most human creations to dust. However, throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, there are still bridges that can be walked on, aqueducts that look almost ready for use, and roads that serve as the foundation for modern highways. The legacy of Roman engineers has proven to be more durable than the empire itself. The main reason for this longevity is excessive quality. The Romans built not for decades, but for centuries. They built their structures with a margin of strength that seems wasteful from a modern perspective. The foundations of roads and buildings went meters deep, and the walls were several times thicker than required by calculations. The second factor is materials. We have already talked about the genius of Roman concrete based on Pozzolana. This material does not simply deteriorate over time, it becomes stronger. Chemical reactions that began 2,000 years ago continue to this day, making the structure more monolithic and resistant to aggressive environments. The third secret is a brilliant understanding of physics and mechanics. The Romans did not simply copy the arch, they understood its essence. Arches and vaults are structures that work under compression, and stone and concrete work perfectly under compression. They learn to distribute weight so that their structures support themselves. Roman engineers were obsessed with fighting the main enemy of any builder, water. Roads had a sloping profile and drainage ditches. Building foundations were insulated. Aqueducts had inspection wells for cleaning and repair. They understood that the height of a wall was not as important as the dryness of its foundation. Modern large-scale construction, military engineering, standardization, and quality control systems all have their roots in the practices of the Roman legions and architects. When we look at the Pont du Gard, or the Colosseum, we see more than just ancient ruins. We see the triumph of a system a system that was able to mobilize thousands of people, standardize materials and processes, and apply simple but effective technologies to achieve grandiose goals. Their speed was not a miracle, but the result of the entire power of a vast empire being focused through the lens of engineering thought. They built quickly because they did not know how to build any other way. For them, construction was as much an act of world domination as war or lawmaking. We have taken a journey into a world where the shovel was as important a tool as the sword, and where the speed of construction was key to the Empire's survival. We saw that faster did not mean worse for the Romans. On the contrary, their speed was the result of impeccable organization, standardization, and the use of revolutionary materials, such as porcelana-based concrete. Their roads, aqueducts, and amphitheaters are not just monuments to the past. They are an eternal rebuke, and at the same time, a textbook for modern engineers. They prove that discipline, a systematic approach, and a deep understanding of materials can work wonders that are beyond the reach of time. Roman engineers did not build for themselves, they built for eternity.